There are symbols on our highways, uh, if you think about it. There's the stop sign and the stop sign ahead, and there's the curve ahead and all of those different signs. Uh, when I'm teaching transportation engineering, I talk about three E's, engineering, education, and enforcement. Well, three weeks ago, I was on my way to Mobile and I got to meet the last of those E's, enforcement. <laughs> We're going through Montgomery, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, and next thing I know, the blue light's behind me. So I pull over, and of course, Jane's already given me, I told you to slow down. And, uh, but they change speed limits real quick, and the officer comes up to the outside, you know, insurance, proof of uh, ownership, da da da, license. So we hand all that to him, and he goes back, and he comes back, and he's about to write a ticket, and, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a transportation engineer. And, you know, I feel yeah, right. I teach the three E's, and, you know, the engineering, and the education, and the enforcement, and you've just taken care of the enforcement. Uh, you know, and just as quick as can be, and he says, and I also have taken care of the education. You know those little signs that say, speed limit, 60 miles? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. All right, you, you got me. I can still have to pay the ticket, but we'll, we'll get there on another day. Um, well, let's see the need. The, the author starts out the lesson talking about she prayed at a U.S. citizenship ceremony, and she was talking about all the different nationalities that were there at that citizenship, a diverse population, but they were about to become one community. They were about to become citizens in the United States. Now. She also raised the question that, you know, is the lamb still a symbol of sacrifice? You've got to remember when you're reading Revelation, read it in the context of first century Christians, okay? They knew what lambs were. Lambs were very important. Will the millennials today understand what lambs are? Can you think of anything else that might symbol sacrifice besides a lamb? I had a little trouble with that one. I kind of thought of a dove, but then I said a dove is more Holy Spirit and peace. Bull, ram, we'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. But the lamb really is, we've just heard all of our life, the sacrificial uh, uh, word of the sacrificial lamb. And the old world, if you will, or the first century, understood the meaning of lamb. They grew sheep. The sheep gave them wool. The sheep gave them milk. The sheep gave them dung that they could use for fuel, and after all of that, it gave them food. All right? So the sheep was a very useful uh, animal. Uh, they raised uh, sheep just on all the countrysides. How many of you have ever raised sheep? Okay, I see a hand or two. Uh, how many of you have ever seen sheep sheared? Okay, I've done that. We see we're not millennials. Uh, Jane tells the story that um, she grew up on a farm and they raised sheep and they had, you know, sometimes the sheep have lambs at the most inopportune moments, like in January when it's 10 degrees or something like that, and they had a little lamb that was going to freeze, so they brought it into the house and trying to warm it up, and her dad, uh, who was a teetotaler, uh, but they had the Jack Daniels or the bourbon, I guess, in Kentucky, uh, that they used for the boiled custard at Christmas time. And he got a little bit of that out, put it in a, a baby bottle, you know, and, and fed the lamb. And Jane tells the story that the next thing, you know, suddenly the, the lamb's waking up, and, and then it's like this, and then, you know, it's on the uh, floor, kitchen uh, linoleum floor, and the four legs go in this direction, and uh, her dad says, time for it to go back to mama. Uh, but anyway, it revived the, the uh, lamb. Well, we're no longer an agricultural uh, nation, if you will. I thought this was interesting in the story. The author said in 2015 that 62.7% of the uh, United States population lived in cities that occupy only 3.5% of the land. No wonder we have traffic congestion. Okay. Well, the early Christians certainly understood sacrifices. The Day of Atonement uh, celebrated in the Jewish tradition they, they used lambs sometimes, but usually it was a bull or a ram. But on the day of Passover, they used a lamb because we all know that the lamb's blood was what was uh, uh, spread on the door frames and the frame over the top, the door top, so that the angel of death would pass over. This was the final straw that the Egyptians finally said, okay, we've got to let these people go. 
uh, they're, they're, they're killing us literally and figuratively with the firstborn. The lamb, uh, the word lamb in Revelation is a special Greek word, and it's used 29 times. And these 29 times, uh, they talk about uh, elsewhere in the New Testament only once. So the lamb, kind of referring to uh, Jesus, if you will, with a special meaning, is uniquely the Revelation. It's used throughout the Revelation. All right? Now, let me ask you a question. The Ten Commandments, the tablets, how many sides were words written on? I, you know, I, I, I don't know whether I would have gotten this right yet or not, but most of the cartoons and stuff show, you know, Moses with two tablets and they're written and all you see is one side. So most of us tend to think one side. They were written on both sides, okay? And today in the reading, they're going to talk about a scroll and they're going to talk about it being written on both sides. And that's very unique because the way the scroll and the papyrus was done, on one side, the seams kind of run horizontally. On the outside, they run vertically. And if you've ever tried to write something going from left to right or however they wrote it vertically, it, it didn't write real well. So the typical scroll of the day was only wrote, written on the inside where the, the seams ran horizontally. But they make a point saying that this scroll that is opened was written on both sides and they made the point of the symbolism that it was just like the tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. We're going to hear about four living creatures. These are exalted angels. Supposedly they were a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle, or at least in the kind of the image. That represented the universe. Now they left out fish. I don't know why. But a lion was royalty, king of the jungle. An ox was strong, a bird, a, uh, you know, a beast of burden. Man represented humankind, and then you have the eagle that could fly free and, and look over the world. Okay. You're going to hear a lot about the seven spirits. These spirits had double meanings. In one area, they're kind of lights or they're torches that could be seen. In other instances, they are eyes, like God looking out, seeing, with the seven spirits, so they could be lights that you could see, or they could be eyes that would be all seeing, if you will. Okay, let's look at uh, the purpose of the lesson is to appreciate the symbolism and significance of Christ as the lamb that was slain. Now, like I said earlier, I guess in my prayer, a lot of people kind of fear Revelation. But it's an exciting book if you kind of unpeel it, kind of like an onion. And I thought the author did a great job of saying, it's the Bible's happy ending. It's the Bible's happy ending. I think you hear a little bit about that today. It's a book of hope, and it's a book towards unity. Think about, think a picture. You know, we've just heard that uh, maybe the two Koreas are talking to each other. Uh, you know, from our lifetime with the Korean War, they've never had peace. Now, maybe they, they might. Uh, there was a uh, uh, article, I guess it was 60 Minutes here a while back, that talked about the caste system in India and how bad that is and all. But just think about universality or unity if all of the peoples of the world could come together. All right, if you brought your Bibles, you're welcome to read along. Let's look at the... Uh, fifth chapter of Revelation, and I'm going to read the first couple of verses, and then we'll uh, do the 6 through 14. That, and this is John. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth, or under the earth, could open the scroll, or even look inside it. I wept, and wept, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll, or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll, and its seven seals. Okay. Now remember, seven is the completeness. How many days did it take for creation for God? Seven. 
How many continents are there? Seven. Okay, sometimes people now say six because they put Asia and Europe together. But seven is a, a number of, of completeness. Okay. All right, let's start with the sixth verse. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense that are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that in that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped okay well go back we'll just look at the verses real quickly then i saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain standing in the center of the throne and circled by the four <coughs> living creatures and the elders he had he had seven uh, horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, again, seven represents completeness. The lamb is obviously Jesus in this instance, and um, that showing that there's power through death. The horns represented power. Okay, anything that had horns uh, represented power. And the seven spirits, as we talked about, talked about seven representing fullness, and the spirits representing either lights or eyes, okay, whether you're wanting to see or whether you're wanting to uh, be seen. Seventh verse, he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So the lamb, Jesus came and takes the scroll from God Almighty. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints, okay? The harps were not like big harps, we think now. They're more of the smaller harps, if you will. The 24 elders, don't forget, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 uh, apostles, all right? So that's where we get the 24 elders. Now, the prayers, that, well, incense was pretty common in worship and first century, so the listeners would know what that was all about. And they talk about the prayers of the saints. The belief was that prayers from first century Christians were lifted up and then they were presented uh, by saints or angels to God. So, you know, that's what is being described here is uh, uh, the bowls of incense and the prayers are being uh, of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That pretty much covers it. Okay. Jesus' death and resurrection with his blood, sacrificial lamb, purchased salvation for, they say men in my translation, but we'll say humankind, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Tenth verse. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. That one it doesn't jump out at you, but in studying and looking at some of the uh, resources, it's important to say you have made them to be a kingdom and priest. That's a surrogate term for church. You have made them to be a church. 
with a, a kingdom and with priests or preachers to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. That's us, folks. That's us. 11th verse. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. Okay, This is just a celebration. This is a huge crowd. If you picture God Almighty on the throne, the Lamb right there with him, then you've got the elders, you've got these four uh, angels, if you will, representing uh, different animals or looking like different animals, and then you've got thousands upon thousands. You know, that was just for emphasis that too many to count are around it worshiping. Think of it in terms of all of the believers through all times who are collected there. Nowadays, you know, if we believe in heaven, which we do, uh, there would be thousands times thousands times thousands times thousands factorial. All right. So then I looked and heard the voice of many angels. Well, let's say, I'm sorry. Uh, Twelfth verse. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Okay. That verse has seven different attributes. Okay. The Lamb who was slain receives power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, praise. All of those are pretty self-explanatory. But it lists seven. In an earlier verse, it listed three. In a later verse, the next one I think I'm going to read, it lists four. And then in our Sunday school lesson, they listed three, and they didn't do it in the same order it was in the Bible. That bothered me. You know, I, I said, author, why didn't you at least put them in the same order as it was in, in the Scripture? Same words, but in a little bit different order. Thirteenth verse. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Uh, a, a wonderful celebration, if you will, that uh, forever and everybody, I mean animals, creatures, in the sea, out the sea, under the sea, everybody should have these attributes to God, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Then the concluding uh, kind of a dramatic ending to this chapter 5, the four living creatures uh, said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Okay? Now remember that uh, you know this uh, book should be read with enthusiasm, and it should be read with its symbolism. Okay? Uh, that song that I played by Neil Diamond, when he was saying, your hand, reach out, and the other hand, reach up. You know what I thought about? Statue. Statue. Statue out in front of our, our lovely church where God is reaching down and we are reaching up. Also, the, that song that we played earlier, kind of getting back to it a little bit, is probably not politically correct totally today. Notice that it said, old ladies. <laughs> Should have probably said old men too, but it was in 1969. And, it, and when he was doing the shouting and kind of getting the, you know, the crowd in the uh, temper of Iowa uh, wound up, was saying brothers, you say like, brothers and sisters, okay. Uh, so from that perspective, but it's you know it's a, a good thought. That was kind of like a tent revival. Our Sunday school lesson today, they were they were enthusiasm, but instead of being in a tent, they were in heaven. And I think Neil Diamond Jewish. Do what now? And I think Neil Diamond is. And yeah, and uh, good point. Neil Diamond is Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, he, that's not the only song that he's written that kind of has a, a holy uh, twinge to it, all right? But if you think about it, um, Jews, Christians, all of us are God's creation, okay? And, uh, you know, on that day of, of reckoning, I'll leave it at that, 
you can think probably what I was going to, what I was going to say. Uh, is God going to be inclusive or exclusive? Okay, uh, well, the key verse in this lesson was, Worthy is the slaughtered lamb to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and might, and honor, glory, and blessing. All right? All of those are pretty easy, except wealth. I, I kind of looked at that one a little bit. Wealth. Now, is the sacrificial lamb Jesus going to be wealthy? I think by what they, on that, what they meant was, worthy of our gifts our tithes our offerings that's how Jesus is rich Jesus is also rich with our service but if you think about you know wealth uh, you think about Mother Teresa all the great things she did she's never wealthy but she had a wealth of uh, goodness a wealth of following so wealth can mean things besides money what are your thoughts on Revelation what, what do you what do you know about it? Um, well, to me, it's a book of encouragement for the Christians of that day who were being persecuted. That's the way I, I view it. And John was trying to encourage them and tell them, "You're being persecuted, but we're all, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. We'll all be in heaven." And um, and that's the way I. Feel. The, the comment was Revelation is kind of a book of uh, persecution, and they definitely were being persecuted at that particular time. Have you ever heard the stories about the uh, uh, 12 days of Christmas, that that was basically code for some of the things that were going on? You know, they, each thing had a symbol, and when I'm reading Revelation, I kind of think about uh, that in terms of there were some codes, because some of the, the, the 666 could well have been Nero. All right, because there was uh, emperor worship going on. Uh, Christians were being thrown to the lion, lions. They were being uh, killed, uh, executed, crucified, all of those sort of things. So there was a lot going on there. And it's hard for us to read Love Revelation as a first century Christian simply because we don't know everything that was going on. But you really have to kind of put on your first, Christian hat, uh, first century Christian hat be able to do that. Saw a hand back here. Okay, Mike. You, you mentioned a happy ending. Uh, it could be a happy beginning. True, true. A happy beginning. You know, you, di you didn't know what was going on probably before you were born. And, uh, but you, you, you know, most of us have enjoyed this life and we, th it's a known. <coughs> and the unknown is a little bit different. But who's to say the unknown is not even better than the current. Okay, and good, good point. Rachel. There are two um, lambs in the stained glass windows in the sanctuary. One is <coughs> under the central figure of Jesus, mm -hmm. and it's the Lamb of God holding the flag of victory. <coughs> and then the other one is on the north <coughs> window, and it is the Lamb sitting on the seven in Revelation. Okay, good point. Uh, what she said for the listening audience uh, was that there are two lambs in the stained glass windows in our church. And our author mentioned the symbolism, said that when I go in, when she goes into a church, she looks around and she can tell a lot about the congregation by what they hold dear. And um, I got to thinking, you know, the little chapel right around the corner here from the Sun School tells us that we hold dear our heritage. Our stained glass windows tell things. A lot of times in a church, the cornerstone of when it was, you know, 1885 or whatever, whenever it was founded, tells you something about that church and how they uh, worship. I hate it when I when I see churches going under and then those buildings becoming other things. I just kind of think back about, well, wonder who that congregation was, wonder what happened to them, why did they go away, those sort of things. Yeah. I think Revelation is also a prophetic book about the end of time and written to us today. Right, yeah. It, it is, Revelation is a prophetic book about the end of times. And, uh, you know, in that first century, they thought people would still be alive when Jesus returned. 
And uh, a couple of Sundays ago when we were studying John, you know, it said the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then there was the one of the verses that said, you know, he might not die and he might still be, or implied that he might still be alive when Jesus returned. And that hadn't happened 21 centuries later. You know, we're still waiting, but we shouldn't get complacent and we couldn't think that it couldn't happen. And somebody, one, one, I mentioned that one time, and somebody says, and maybe that it hadn't already happened. It mentions in there several times about the one that Jesus loved. Mm -hmm. uh, are they trying to say that he didn't love the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a couple of Sundays ago I mentioned on that one, it, it almost sounds a little self-serving. But uh, the other thing is that John so loved Jesus that you know that may have just been a, a term that he was using and Peter got a little jealous there uh, in a verse you know he says well what about that other one and Jesus pretty much said don't worry about John worry about yourself okay and he forecast what would happen to Peter being crucified upside down pretty much. you'll be led where you don't want to be led okay but John died at an old age right yeah John is the only apostle that died of natural death old age what else? It is a celebration. Did any of you see, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, uh, as you talked about blessing and glory and honor and strength and wisdom and so on, that's from Handel's Messiah, from the part that's called Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Mm -hmm, right, from Handel's Messiah, uh, those, those terms and words are there. There was a 60 Minutes uh, TV show a couple of weeks ago. I, I just taped it because I didn't get to see it, but then I went back, and uh, Gail, for your benefit, and anybody else that's from Kentucky, uh, there was a Kentucky professor, and then two Italian uh, scientists, I'm not sure whether they were professors or not, that had gotten real interested in uh, scrolls. And they had uncovered the city that was covered, it was not uh, Pompeii, but it was Herculaneum, I believe, but it was covered in about 95 AD with 40 or 50 feet of ash from Mount Vesuvius. Uh, it's the same eruption, uh, that, that volcano had not erupted for 800 years, so everybody thought it was dead, wrong. Uh, it got Pompeii, it got that city, uh, had about a thousand population or so. But it started when some archaeologists or scientists at that time uncovered or discovered that this whole city was buried underneath this, you know, 50 or 60 feet of ash. They started looking at things and they found charred scrolls. And everybody that has ever tried to unroll any of those scrolls, they just crumpled. You know, it's like take newspaper, roll it up and burn it, and then try to open it up and read it, uh, it doesn't work. So this professor from the University of Kentucky and these other two Italians said, well, why not use medical techniques, okay, of where you do uh, an x-ray of an individual, and then we can maybe figure out some letters. Well, the problem was, if you x-rayed it, yeah, you might see a bunch of lines and some other things, but you hadn't unrolled it. Well, then the professor in Kentucky and some of his colleagues uh, wrote an algorithm which would allow it to be unrolled. And then they showed some of the pictures. So these were scrolls from the first century or earlier that could have all kinds of information. They've only kind of unrolled one or two of them. But think about some of the reading, maybe some of the early versions of the Bible uh, maybe some new information that comes out of that that uh, uh, will uh, lend insights to the first century or the early, even before Christ, uh, worshiping things. It was pretty fascinating of what was going on. And then there was, of course, the rivalry between the two Italian scientists and the uh, Kentucky professor, and one of them was saying that, you know, that's bunk, and the other one was saying, you stole my technique, and uh, all, all that stuff that, that goes on with that. Well, if you think about this celebration, uh, the, the Revelation, it's an interesting book. And the one takeaway, or one of the takeaways that I'd like for you to get from this is don't be afraid of it. 
uh, sit down and, and read it and, and look at it and think about the celebration of all of the nations coming together. I want to read the prayer that our author um, shared with that citizenship group. Remember at the start, I said that she was honored to be offered, uh, asked to offer a prayer to this collection of conglomerate of people from all these different nations. And it says, uh, she, she prefaced the prayer, Revelation is a great book of hope because it reminds us that we're all headed towards unity and is, is sacrifice, sacrificial divine love that will take us there. That'll preach. All right, here's what she prayed. The day I prayed for the Immigration and Naturalization Service, I had a glimpse of what that moment would look like. So many people, different accents, different appearances, but all speaking as one. That day is coming for the entire world. Only instead of pledging allegiance to one nation, we will align ourselves under one God, the Lamb who was slain for us all. I offered this prayer that day, a prayer we can look forward to being fulfilled in a broader sense one day. Holy Creator of all have designed a beautiful world, a world, I left out some lines, that you have created. So you call for the many to become one. When we are at our best, we reflect your unity. Today is one of those days when we are at our best. The people before us who represent so many ways of living and being will take an oath to be one with us today. But their oath is their gift to us. They promise to share their talents, their cultures, their ways of living and loving. And as we accept them, let us learn from them. When we listen to one another and share ideas and beliefs, we are stronger and we draw closer to understanding you, O oh God. Bless the journey that is ahead for these wonderful people, a journey that we all take together. You have entrusted us with a beautiful country full of diverse places and full of diverse people, and we are all the richer for it. Amen. If you think about the United States, and you know we've always been referred to as the melting pot, and uh, I've never really gotten into ancestry. I'm afraid how many horse thieves I might find back in the lineage or you know hoodlums. But but as I get older, I, I think I'm, I'm beginning to do that a little bit. But you know whether you're Irish or English or German or Polish or Oriental or Asian or you know all the different uh, nationalities that we come from, we come to be one in the United States. And this story in Revelation is talking about all of that diversity coming one under God and under the slain lamb. That's that's the message for today. Final comments. Let's close with prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these Christians that are in your house to be about your business. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for diversity. We thank you that we can learn things from other people with different cultures, different ideas but that we should recognize that we are all one. We are all created by the same God Almighty and that we are your creation and we were formed in your image. Help us to live up to that image. Help us to do your will and help us to be beacons of light in this world that sometimes has so much darkness and shootings and other things that have happened recently. Be with all those that are suffering now be with all of those that are facing medical difficulties. And dear Lord, just hold us in the palm of your hand. Give us comfort, give us wisdom, and give us unity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.